I want to share with you uh, some ideas today about what uh, is not very well known. Not many people know much about the psychology of risk. In fact, if you do a search on Google, you won't see uh, or find many publications on it. It's, uh, it's quite new. And I, I have a question for you, um, uh, which is why, what is this thing, the psychology of risk? Uh, there are a whole range of things we could talk about, but I'm only going to just focus on about two things today. And I'm actually going to uh, get you to do something in a minute. And so uh, when you've finished your, uh, your bread, we'll, we'll do something quite interesting. What's the psychology of risk? The psychology of the risk is a combination of two things and the way that they join together. The first is the neuropsychology of the brain and the mind. Now, uh, you may not know this, but it, it, it hasn't been until recently to the development of the FRI, fMRI scanning that we've got to know, or the science world's got to know much, much more about the connection between the physicality of the brain and how the mind works. And uh, some of the publications, even in just the last five years, have shown some incredible new advances in understanding the connection between brain and mind and neuropsychology. The second thing it joins together is the social psychology of groups and organisations. And this is where I come mostly from. My PhD was in social psychology. Uh, I have a master's degree from Sydney University in education. I have a master's degree in uh, occupational health and safety from La Trobe University and a range of other things. I previously um, worked at the University of Canberra here. I've uh, worked at ANU. I'm currently an honorary fellow at ACU National, which is the Catholic University. Of all things, in the School of Social Work, I found a home uh, for the psychology of risk. Um, which is a bit funny. I, I did work in the public service. I worked for three years in the public service, in the ACT public service, and I know this gentleman here, Jurgen LeBang. Uh, when Jurgen was in the education department, I was the manager of youth, community and family support. And so, uh, yes, I, I, I spent three years in, in the same department with Jurgen, and we know each other fairly well. Um, when we look at this joining together social psychology of groups and organisations and how the brain and mind works, we really come across this thing called the nature of human judgment and decision making. And if you want to be a good leader, I think you really need to know much, as much as possible about how humans make sense of their world and how they make judgments and what drives their judgments. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to keep away from the uh, longer academic words and we're going to focus on human judgment and decision making. All right, here's time for an experiment. I want you to do something without thinking about it, because you don't know what it's going to be, but if you could just put your coffee and your, your knife down for a minute, and I hope your finger's clean, I just want you to draw a Q, a Q on your forehead, please. If you could just draw a Q on your forehead. Thank you. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time analysing what this is about, but you actually just made a choice. And the choice that you made was actually um, an unconscious choice. An unconscious choice or a subconscious choice. I'll get this working right in a minute. Here we go. So you made an unconscious or subconscious choice. Did you write the cue so I could read it? Or did you write the cue so that you could read it? Can you remember? Why did you choose to write it that way? What happened? In an instant, in a millisecond, you just drew the cue and one chose to do it for me and the other one chose to, do it, to draw it for you. Now, this is what we learn in um, neuropsychology, that there's this thing called implicit knowledge, gut implicit knowledge, and we use it 85% of the time. We make decisions. Even when we go to buy a house or a car or spend a substantial amount of money, we still make many, many of our decisions based upon this gut implicit knowledge. Um, and that comes from experience, of course, but it's very, very fastly acting knowledge. It's funny, you know, when we create systems for people, we think that most decision making is rational, we have lots of time to make those decisions, and that our systems, which are often long, and our forms and our bureaucracy, which is often painstakingly um, dense and these days highly complex, we think that's how people make decisions. And yet, the evidence shows that in the milliseconds before we come to that decision, 
in jumps our gut implicit knowledge, which is, by the way, highly reliable, and we use that as well. So we often think we've made a rational choice, and in fact, we actually made an emotional choice. And sometimes we don't even know why we made it, um, and it's in that subconscious. And of course, to know more about that <coughs> is to know more about what's called a human being's mentality. Now, I need to explain when that's not a spelling mistake. <laughs> This comes from a French notion, from a French school of history. They're called the, the Annals School of History. And it's a social psychological approach to history. You don't look at dates and you don't look at people's behaviour. You look at the history of how people made sense of their world at the time. And the Annals School of History tells us that even some of the major decisions that have been made in the world uh, leading to wars and all sorts of terrible things were also made by this gut split instant unconscious sometimes subconscious decision making and the Annals school of history say that our mentality is the way we make sense of the world it's called sense making okay and and they estimate the scholars who do this research say that 85 percent of our decision making comes from this comes from this in, implicit gut sense making that we have. Now it may be the composition of all the things we've done in the past, that's true, that's contributed to the way we make sense. What is interesting is our experiences are different, so when we come to sense making they're actually not something we share in common and that's why it's hard to understand other people and the way they make sense of things. That's why however or why you made the decision to draw the cue the way you did it, it was unique to you in that moment. We could do other experiments, but we're not going to do them. So there's a strong connection between the psychology of risk, the uh, theory or the methodology of mentalities, which is, which is uh, pioneered by a guy called Ju uh, Julian Lefebvre, and then this whole idea of sense making. And if you want to know more about how sense making connects to the psychology of risk, um, there's a, a colleague and a scholar at Michigan University, uh, I would consider him a genius, Professor Carl E. Week. Professor Week wrote a book called Sense Making in Organisations, an absolutely brilliant book in two volumes, very, very dense, hard to read, but uh, brilliant stuff. And he goes further into how do people really make judgments and decisions. And uh, I'm going to just break away from this and ask you a question. How much have you considered this whole idea of human judgment decision making in the way you consider your business, policy development or the strategic thinking in what you do? I guess connecting a little bit back to uh, Alan's story of sometimes you can be con so consumed in the process of doing something that you actually haven't even strategically considered the humans who are going to use the thing which you're about to develop or the policy you're about to implement. So. That's the question for us. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, this is a unique picture. You won't see this picture anywhere else. Um, Todd and Brandt don't even have this picture, and some of you know uh, my experiences, but some uh, maybe not. Um, I was on the Emergency Coordination Operations Group at Beaconsfield, uh, where Todd and Brandt were trapped underground in a, uh, a cavity about the size of this table. I've had my head in that table. I don't know how they survived, because Todd and Brandt are bigger than me. Both of them are larger men than me. And they were busy shoring up a, uh, a, a, a cavity in, in a mine when there was a seismic activity and it collapsed and the very cage they were operating in, operating in acted and protected them from the thousands of tonnes of rocks above their head. You know the story. Um, this is a picture we took of Todd and Brandt about five minutes before we pulled them out. You can see them there. Uh, uh, Brandt is actually a, a bit of a joker, so he decides to blow Todd a kiss before we pull him out. That's the feed tube that we got into him, the 35 feet, metre feed tube. We had to come in and up underneath, you probably know the story. Beaconsfield was the largest media event in Australian history. and my role, I was called down on the first day by Matthew Gill, the mine manager, who I'm currently still doing work for. He's currently the manager of Castle Maingold. Uh, I was called down, in fact, to monitor the uh, the psychology of risk within that project and particularly keep my eye on the seven managers and that was my role. So my role was one to stay behind, um, unlike a, a person we know who 
was labelled, you know, the face of Beaconsfield, who actually wasn't even on the emergency committee, sat outside the fence and collected members' uh, yeah, second-hand knowledge and ran to the media. Um, that is uh, interesting uh, in itself, explains a great deal about the psychology of certain people and their actions and what they do and the judgments and the decisions they make. There's, I've seen a script of the movie that's about to come out about Beaconsfield. Um, and I've had confirmed yet once again that most of the things you see on the media are not true. Um, and certainly that script isn't even close to what happened. Let me tell you a little bit about this. And this is not the story about, this is not the story about Todd and Brent. This is a story about Rex and Pat. Now, two people you don't know. This is Rex here and this is Pat. Pat is the underground mine manager. And Rex is the safety manager for Beaconsfield. Now what's interesting about this story is they both have children and they both have wives and yet well, they got a phone call in the morning when there'd been a collapse and they both live one hour from Beaconsfield in Launceston. Now if you know the low road from Launceston to Beaconsfield, it's terrible. It is a terrible road. Someone should have tweaked. Someone should have been observant because when Rex and Pat both arrived within 30 minutes of the phone call at the mine, they should have known they were not in the psychological space to go underground. But they did. They both went underground and within an hour were in what's called an open stope. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you some footage from uh, Castle Main Gold, which is similar to this gold mine, and I'm going to just talk it over a minute and explain to you what this is all about. You'll see this activity going. This is the kind of stuff that happens. An open stope is, is, an, is an unsustained or an unsupported uh, area of a mine where if a human being goes into it and they're hit by a rock, um, they're certainly uh, going to die. There is, a, there is a rule within mining that human beings do not go into open stopes. They get on these little machines and it's all done by remote. So if you're going to go into an area, there's a machine there and it's like a Game Boy, a PlayStation, you don't go into an open stope. On that morning, Rex and Pat, uh, firing off their gut knowledge, firing off their emotions, <coughs> walked into an open stope and unknown, I don't know if it's going to be in the movie, unknown to nearly everyone, there was a rock fall. And rather than rescuing anyone, and they didn't know if they were alive anyway, both Pat and Rex could have died and they would have had three dead, not one dead. They both went into an open stope. What was it that made them make sense of their world that they thought that was a good judgment and decision? That's what the psychology of risk is about. Why would these people with 25 years experience in the mining industry make that decision to go into that place? That's a fascinating question. Well, people get amazed when things happen like that. I'll give you a few more that you might be more familiar with about this issue of sense making. Uh, how can someone uh, go into an open trench on a building site and break their pelvis because it's not shored up and there's a collapse? How could they do that when they know the rules, they know the regulations, the shoring box is right beside the trench and they still go in. And then the same company in less than a month has the same thing happen in the same site with the same trench in the same place with a similar behaviour. What, what's, what, someone didn't know the rules? No. This is about how people make judgments and decisions and there's not a great deal that people know about it. I'll give you another one. We get amazed when we find that a bridge collapses with 20 men who ride it down. Absolutely amazed. There had to be something wrong with the way it was designed and we start looking for systems and design and things like that. At no time did I hear anything about the inquiry about the collapse of the bridge out of Gungarland that even came close to understanding a connection between the psychology of risk and the causes of that accident or in fact the collapse in Civic at no time. This whole idea of the psychology of risk is not on the radar of most people who are in, either in the union or in the regulators. And that's not to say that by blame, it's because this is new, it's a new frontier, but I think it needs to be included. 
how do people make sense of their world and can we actually know how they do it? If you go to, um, if you go to uh, I think it's a ASNZX 3000, no, 31000, the latest uh, risk assessment um, uh, manual from Standards Australia, you will see there's a compendium that goes with it. It's called HB 327. For the first time, and that's only one year old, came out last year, for the first time the whole idea of heuristics has been mentioned in risk. Now, if you, has anyone here heard of the word heuristics? Heuristics, do you know what it is? It's heuristics are people's micro rules, they're undisclosed micro rules, they're undisclosed assumptions, they're shortcuts, they're mental shortcuts we take that get involved in our sense making. It's part of what I would call our mentality. I'm going to give you a second experiment. Have a look at this lady. Have a look at this lady. Okay, and there are several ways we can respond to this and I'm going to ask you a question. This is, this is the second experiment. Once more, have a look at the ladies behind her. Okay. Why does that lady injure herself? That's my question. Anyone give me an answer? She made a decision to try and catch the... She wanted to win. There, there, there are no wrong answers. That's the right one. She made a decision to catch a bouquet of flowers. What's another reason why she injured herself? Yeah, suppose, speculate. Beg your pardon? She got caught up in the moment. Excellent. Who said that? Who said that? Yes, excellent. She's wearing high heeled shoes. And another? Okay, yes. What else? Thank you. Alcohol, alcohol was part of the uh, occasion. What else do we know? What's hidden? What's, what's, what's the belief? What's the value? What's the cultural norm here? Thank you. Say it, say it again. She's looking to get married because there's a belief that says if you catch that bouquet of flowers, you're next to be married. It's a superstition. I mean, let's get serious. It, there's also other superstitions that say if you wear something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, you'll have a great marriage. It's interesting, another superstition. We'd have wonderful marriages if everyone did that. Here we've got someone who wanted to catch a bouquet of flowers and we've got a choice to look at it in three ways. We can look at it from what I call primary or physical causes. So yes, we have alcohol, yes, we have high-heeled shoes, yes, we have uneven ground, okay? Or we can look at it from a secondary point of view, which is I call the psycho psychological uh, point of view, so we can have primary, secondary and tertiary hazards and risks. The secondary hazard is a psychological hazard. Within her, she's made sense of this moment to be that desperate that even though those bunch of flowers are nearly hard to get, she's going to catch them on the full and she's going to go for them uh, quite hard. And then of course we've got a tertiary issue, which is a cultural issue. So primary, secondary, tertiary, a cultural issue is uh, in fact even more hidden. So there's a hidden belief within the group that she believes in and obviously the ten women behind her don't or have no reason to believe in it. Maybe they've already caught their bouquet of flowers and they're married and they're wishing her on her way. Um, the point of the fact is we can come at that in three different ways. Now, when some of these incidents happen, like uh, the ones I've mentioned to you recently in Canberra, we can say, oh, here's the problem. We need to level the ground paint it an iridescent colour, move the building and make sure that everyone's wearing high vis, ban the alcohol and uh, so on. If we're looking only at physical causes, we will only look at physical solutions. If we only see systems causes, we will only see systems solutions. And so what often happens is, is people have incidents and accidents in buildings and uh, in, in mining and manufacturing and so on, and so often people only see a systems solution because the whole idea of a secondary and tertiary hazard isn't even a part of the analysis. I was involved recently, uh, and you wouldn't have heard of this, uh, the Australian Animal Health Laboratory in Geelong is, a, is perhaps Australia's most high security um, facility. Uh, in that facility there have been several fatalities. Um, and when we went in, I was asked to come in deliberately to look for secondary and tertiary hazards and causes 
of why those people were killed. Now that is actually quite new, quite novel. Um, when you look at many uh, lost time injuries in building and construction uh, industry in particular, you'll see in fact that these are up near the 85% mark of causes. Yet it's funny, so much of what we do and our solutions to so many problems are more systems. I'll go back to Alan's story. You can give a human being lots and lots of systems, it doesn't make them safe. It's their response to the system that makes them safe. Let's just move on. Uh, Albert Einstein said these problems can't be solved by thinking within the framework in which they were created. Or, in a simpler way, whenever you see every problem is a nail, the only solution is a hammer. And we know those sayings. I think if we don't move from within this constant focus on primary hazards and risks and move into the psychology of risk or into this different mentality, I think not much is going to change over the next 10 years in the area of uh, hazard and risk management. Uh, and in fact, many people like Scott Geller and Carl Weeks say this is the new frontier. This is where we have to go next. We already know from neuropsychology a lot more about how people make judgments and decisions. And I'm not talking about, you know, super race microscience. I'm not talking about that. We can lead in a much better way by not creating systems which in fact provoke the response we don't want, which in fact can be quite counterintuitive. Uh, just before I go, I just want to finish off on sense making at Beaconsfield. This is outside. There were, it was the most incredible event. This is looking outside the administration building to the two and a half thousand media plus people who are outside and someone decided right in the middle to set up a jumping castle and a donkey ride. In the end the whole thing became a circus outside. It was unbelievable. And again, the way people make sense of a moment, you know, and this was on the day when Larry's funeral was. So we got one group celebrating uh, uh, on the one day, Todd and Brandt were rescued on the same day that the funeral was held and someone sets up a jumping castle in the middle of it all. So, okay, now there's a piece of paper and a pen on your uh, table. Now don't open out the paper, all I want you to do is to look at those numbers and I'm going to give you 20 seconds to look at them and memorise them. They're deliberately not in the sequence, they're deliberately not in the pat pattern, but those are exactly the same amount of numbers as you would get in a mobile phone. <coughs> the trouble is they're not in a pattern or a sequence. Good. You've had long enough, see how many you can write down in what order. Let's see, did anyone get all of them? I would doubt it. <coughs> we actually know in psychology that there's a limit to human comprehension. That limit to our comprehension is actually nine numbers, not twelve. <coughs> if I give you twelve numbers and give you quite a long time you could eventually memorise them. But because there's no pattern or swing or tune in them, like my mobile phone, if I gave you my mobile phone, you can sing it and so you'll be able to remember it or you'll be able to pattern it. There's no pattern in that and that's very, very hard to do. We know in psychology this thing called flooding. A human being gets flooded and when they flood and they can't think and they can't cope with the complexity around them and, and we have a very complex world, they go back and default to their implicit knowledge. They go back to their heuristics, their gut knowledge, their gut instinct. And so if you're on a building site and you expect a bunch of steel fixers to remember a 20-page safe work method statement, which they actually ticked and flicked anyway, if you expect them to remember that or to remember the sequence of work or whatever and then go and act upon that, you're with the fairies. It cannot be remembered. Human beings get flooded. I got lost the other day in Canberra because I got flooded. I was on the road, on the new road, driving the Glenlock Interchange. Now I've been living here 20 years and I know the pattern of the road and what they, and I still got lost because I came up to it, the traffic was packed, I had to go fast, the signs are terribly small and by the time I got there I found myself in a rander. 
and I was flattered. Not by the signs, I was preoccupied with the meeting I had to go to, and so it happened to me, it can happen to you. Flooding is quite a unique thing. Christine Nixon, I can't believe how much she was vilified in the newspapers. I know people who know her personally, know her personally, and valid, can verify that she is a person of great integrity, uh, great intelligence and responsibility. And yet what happened on the day of the bushfires, the worst bushfires in Australian history, unimaginable, unbelievable things. And so while things are burning down, what did she default to? She was flooded. Her mind was flooded. She got lost. She went to a restaurant. She had some food. When Gough Whitman was sacked, he didn't have his wits about him. What did he do? He went and had a pie and chips. Read the story. When we get flooded, we default to this, this, this hidden micro rule we have and we behave in ways, in fact, not predictable. In fact, the unpredictable uh, part of that uh, from the psychology of risk is actually predictable. The more we know that we're going to get some unpredictable behaviour. Okay, uh, I'll give you just one more. I was in the Winchester Centre during the Canberra bushfires in 2003 when I was, it was my last year in the public service. I heard two senior public service CEOs at the time, I won't mention their names, arguing about a cost centre for a $50 taxi fare in the middle of the conference area, because I was managing Arendelle's um, uh, evacuation centre at the time, and we had to go to the Winchester Centre and have a big meeting. And here were these two CEOs arguing about $50 for a taxi fare from someone, a diabetic, who had to go from Western Creek into the hospital. Now, why did they digress, people with such senior management digress to such an insignificant argument can only be explained by the fact that they were flooded at the moment. And if we understand more about flooding, we will not overload people with systems or we're going to drive them back into uh, decision making based upon these micro rules, which in fact we don't know. And the psychology of risk tells us we need to know much, much more about these micro rules these things which people have that are undisclosed, okay? I'll, I'm going to mention a couple to you and I'm going to put them over the, over the picture of these five steel fixes. The reason why I'm using these five steel fixes is one of them is my son. And I know these five steel fixes very, very well. So I'm going to give you some of their micro rules. Here's one. It's just common sense, which is really amazing. I don't think anything exists. I think you can create common sense. We can all get together and we can all talk about it while we all get feedback and eventually develop some sense of common sense about something, but I can't assume that you have it. Not with all the different experiences we've had in our life. But that's one that flows really, really strongly in the micro rule for those people. They make lots of decisions based upon this thing called common sense and it actually doesn't exist. Another one they have is just get the job done. Another one is we want a can-do attitude. A can-do attitude. It was a can-do attitude that got us an implosion in the hospital that went terribly bad. That will teach them a lesson. The culture of building and construction, particularly in these trades, is unbelievably masculinist and punitive. You solve everything by belting it. You solve everything by hitting it. It's incredible. And last one, be careful. If you'd like to explain to me psychologically what be careful means is, um, I'll uh, give you a price later. Try and define what be careful means. What is it that you actually do psychologically? Psychologically, to be careful. What do you do? What, you weren't careful five seconds ago and now you're careful now? We could talk a lot about that. Why did I use the picture of the five steel fixes? At the time of this photo, four of them were heroin addicts working full time in a big job here in Civic. Every day, every year, for three years, these guys were working on Section 84 and so on. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's hidden, which in fact we don't know about the psychology of risk, and it's probably about time we got to know more about it. 
I run a survey uh, I developed with uh, Professor Week in the United States. We use a little keypad tool and we try to test implicit knowledge. We give everyone a keypad, we run a survey, but you actually only get three seconds to answer a question. And so when we throw a question at you, it's a bit Freudian, you give your responses. I'll show you the results. I've done it with 10,000 construction workers Australia-wide and um, I've been doing it over the last eight years. If you want to see the results of that survey, it's just been published in the back of this uh, wonderful publication, uh, Building News with the MBA. It's back there in the back of the pages there. Um, I run this little uh, profile survey. I'm going to show you the results. Here they are. Here's the top 10 running in building the construction at the moment. We have a 78% disposition of overconfidence in the building and construction centre se sector. That means when I give you three seconds and ask you a question, most people, when they answer the question, they actually think they're answering the question. It's the way they ask the question, they're overconfident. There's a preoccupation with the cosmetics of safety, which, uh, which Carl Week talks a lot about. They have very, very simplistic and naive safety rules or micro rules. That's running at 75%. And this is with 10,000 people in the database done across all the tier 1s down to many of the tier 5s and 6s in Canberra. They have a misunderstanding of safety bureaucracy. There's an imbalance between program cost safety trade-offs. There's a tendency to blame rather than learn from incidents. That's running at 68%. There's a 65% fatalistic rate in building and construction. In other words, there's a belief it's going to happen anyway. There's a lack of doubt. So once you make a decision, I can't possibly be wrong, so why should I check with someone else? So let's just go in. That's running at 64% in the industry. Insufficient positive focus. In other words, the industry in itself is negative, it's punitive, and most of the time it's about blaming who's done something wrong. In fact, what are our measures or our KPIs in building and construction are mostly about mistakes. We mostly measure mistakes and what's wrong. And the acceptance of double speaks running at 60%. So that's all come out of the survey. I'd love to do the survey with you one day. I did it with the Department of Defence last year with 1,000 across the Commonwealth Department and it was on the psychology of risk and security. I'd love to show you the results, but they'd kill me if I did. And I don't have security clearance anyway. Um, but if you want to know more about that, you can ring people in DSA in the uh, Defence Security Authority and they could show you some aspects of that. Uh, Bruce Matia there would, would, would help you out. So from the database, this is what we're currently running with and this is all about trying to measure the sense making of the industry at the moment. And I think that's what we're really battling. We don't understand that's what we're battling and the sooner leaders and managers within the industry do, then we might design the things that we put in front of these people a little bit differently. One of the things I advocate as a solution, and I haven't been wanting to just pose problems and explain, is I really think this is where we need to go. Skilling up the industry much, much better on their safety conversations on site. When someone's swamped and they're totally overwhelmed and they're flooded and the systems are there and they didn't like the JCA anyway and they didn't listen to the toolbox talk and they can go out on the site, it's at that moment that conversation, that skilled conversation is what they need Unfortunately, um, those soft skills of effective conversations also aren't on the radar of the building and construction industry.